Hello everyone and uh, thank you for listening to this uh, presentation. The whole Bible is the word of the living God. Now, when I were a lad, as they say, as the saying goes, if I wanted to know something, I'd either need to ask a knowledgeable parent or a teacher, or indeed find somebody with a a bookcase full of Encyclopedia Britannica. Now look at look at that uh, one there. 1910 to 1911. 44 million words of text and uh, they used to cost a fortune. Or I'd have to venture down to the local library. That's uh, an image of the old library in the Hayes in, in Cardiff. Now, obviously I'd uh, keep a low profile, not wanting any of my friends to see me popping into a library. But um, modern children, of course, haven't got that problem because they now call them hubs. And they can uh, go in there and do lots of other things apart from look at books. Nowadays, of course, when faced with similar problems or questions, people just say, oh, for goodness sake, just Google it. And you can see there on the screen, the man says, I'm looking for the meaning of my life. And the wife who's drinking a cup of tea, watching the telly says, Google it. And you hear people saying, Google it all the time. Well, in preparation for this talk, I thought I'd have a look at uh, Google and uh, I typed in, what are Christadelphians? Now, I was very interested to uh, come across a BBC article and it was it was buried amongst um, a religion section on the BBC and I thought I'd share with you what this impartial source has said about uh, Christadelphians. So they regard the Bible as inspired by God and completely free of error and the only source of knowledge about God and his plans. They believe that the Bible should be read as a whole and understand through the plain meaning uh, of its words. They aim to read the Old Testament once a year and the New Testament twice a year following a reading plan called the Bible Companion. They believe that without daily spiritual food from the Bible, they will die spiritually and God's kingdom would be lost. If they feed on the word of God every day, then they will grow spiritually. Whilst Christadelphians value the many books written by senior members, they do not treat them as having any particular authority and do not believe that they have had any special revelation from God because they base all their beliefs solely on a close study of the Bible. Now, as Googling goes, I was quite pleased with uh, with that, even though it's a good few years old. I thought, well, that's a fair uh, interpretation, a representation uh, uh, of what we as a religious organization believe. So is the whole Bible the word of the living God? Can we believe this lecture title? Now, to believe in something, we need to be able to trust it. Now, this is taken from the free, free dictionary and, it, and it's basically what does the word belief mean? The mental act, condition or habit of placing trust or confidence in another. Mental acceptance of and conviction in the truth, actuality or validity of something and something believed or accepted as true. Now let's remind us of a section from 2 Timothy chapter 3 that we had as an opening reading. But thou, continue in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child Thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given 
by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Now I'd like you to pay particular attention to those two verses at the end there, verses 16 and 17, and just let those words sink in. So all scripture is given by inspiration. So it's, it's like the breath of God and it's worthwhile. That's what profitable means for doctrine, which is teaching for reproof, correction and instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Now, the Bible is not one book, but it's actually a collection of 66 books. It begins with the five books of Moses, namely Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy. As well as the law of Moses, these books contain history. Beginning with the creation and the flood, they go on to tell the history of the Jewish people from the time of Abraham to Moses' death several hundred years later, just as the Jews were about to enter the land of Israel. More books of history follow, some beautiful books of poetry and then prophecy conclude the first section of the Bible and uh, it's known nowadays as the Old Testament. Then there's the New Testament. It begins with four books, namely Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, and they make up the biographies of Jesus Christ. They describe his ministry, death and resurrection. Matthew and Luke also give details of his birth. The fifth book of the New Testament is called the Acts of the Apostles, which begins with Jesus Christ's ascension into heaven. And then it goes on to describe the history of the early ecclesia or church concentrating on the missionary work of Paul. And the next 21 books are letters which were written by the apostles about Christ's teaching. Some were letters written to individuals and others were written to groups of believers. The final book of the New Testament is called Revelation, which is a book of prophecy in the New Testament. The final three chapters are of particular note, describing judgment and the earth that we live on today under the reign of Jesus Christ. Despite the fact that followers of Christ are not bound by the law of Moses, there can be little doubt that the Old Testament is just as important as the New. In John chapter 5 verse 47 Christ says if ye believe not his writings and he's referring to Moses how shall ye believe my words Christ is linked with the prophet Jonah in Matthew chapter 12 verse 40 for example for as Jonah's was three days and three nights in the whale's belly so shall the son of man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth Christ is also linked with the first man called Adam. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 22, for example, for as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. So if we take the record of Jesus Christ as true, then we must accept the records of Jonah and Adam which means that we must accept that the whole of the Bible is true and that it is all the word of the living God. The Apostle Paul, one of the New Testament authors, wrote in Acts 24 verse 14, But I confess this unto thee, that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. So Paul believed all things written in the law and in the prophets, which was simply the New Testament term for the Old Testament. 
in Acts 17 and verse 11, the Jews in Berea searched the scriptures daily when they learned about Christ. And don't forget, they were looking at what we call the Old Testament. In 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 2, we are told to be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets. That's the holy prophets in the Old Testament. And we remember that in 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 15 that we read earlier, a friend of Paul's was familiar with the Old Testament from his childhood. Now we firmly believe that the Bible is without error. Consider Hebrews chapter 1 verse 1. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners, spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. Also consider 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 21. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Now the Holy Spirit is the power that God uses. It's very clear from these quotes in the Bible that if it's true, it must be the word of God. God would not have lied to his holy men of old. Another very powerful piece of evidence that the whole Bible is true is the way that Christ and the apostles considered the Old Testament, the way they referred to it, the way they used it in daily conversation. They never treated any passage as though it was something to be partly believed. We can confidently say that the Bible always says what it means. Consider this amazing example, this prophecy from Micah chapter 5 and verse 2. But thou, Bethlehem Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel. Now, according to Matthew chapter 2 verse 6, this was fulfilled by Jesus Christ being born in Bethlehem. And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. These passages clearly show that when the Bible says something, it says it plainly and it will happen. So when we read things like this in Acts chapter 1 verse 11, this same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. What else could it possibly mean other than Jesus Christ will literally return to the earth one day? It's plain, it's simple, but it's very exciting. We mentioned earlier that the Bible is a remarkable collection of books. It contains huge amounts of evidence that it was written under inspiration by God. Why should we believe it then? Well, here are just two examples for us to consider. There are many prophecies in the Bible and they are there for a reason, to show us that the Bible was written by God. Consider the history of the Jews. Once they lived in Israel, then the land was invaded and the Jews were dispersed for nearly 2,000 years. Now this is a scene from the Lachish relief showing Judahites from Lachish in Assyrian captivity and they're playing a later form of the Egyptian lyre. And this is an artist's depiction of the deportation and exile of the Jews of the ancient kingdom of Judah to Babylon and the destruction of Jerusalem and Solomon's temple. Then the land was invaded and the Jews were dispersed for nearly 2,000 years. 
This is a depiction of Roman persecution. Can you see the artifacts being carried? Depiction of the Roman triumph celebrating the sack of Jerusalem on the Arch of Titus in Rome. The procession features the menorah, which is that candlestick, and the other vessels taken from the second temple. Of course, we also know in more modern times of the awful Nazi persecution. And you see examples there of the night of the smashed glass and the children, women and men being carried around like cattle in carts. Despite their subsequent persecution, they were never completely destroyed. There's always been a remnant uh, remaining and they then began to return to the land of Israel. Whatever your feelings about the rights and wrongs of that branch of Middle Eastern politics, you can't doubt that Jewish history has been remarkable. It's even more remarkable when you consider that all of their history was recorded in advance in the Bible. Before entering the land of Israel, the children of Israel, as the Jews are sometimes called, were told that if they were obedient, they would live in the land in peace and prosperity. But if they were disobedient, Deuteronomy chapter 28 verse 64 tells us, the Lord will scatter you among all peoples from one end of the earth to the other. And there thou shalt serve other gods, which if neither thou nor thy fathers have known, even wood and stone. And that's what's happened to them on various occasions, as we've seen in the previous slides. Despite being scattered, they would never be completely destroyed. Jeremiah 30, verse 11. For I am with thee, saith the Lord, to save thee. Though I make a full end of all nations whither I have scattered thee, yet I will not make a full end of thee. But I will correct thee in measure and will not leave thee altogether unpunished. Eventually the Jews were to be regathered and returned to Israel, as we can read in Ezekiel chapter 11 verse 17. Therefore say, thus saith the Lord God, I will even gather you from the people and assemble you out of the countries where ye have been scattered, and I will give you the land of Israel. This is the Haganah ship, and Haganah means uh, defence. And the Haganah organisation, amongst other things, brought Jews to Palestine in defiance of British policy in 1947. So even then, pressure was starting um, to bear upon the world. And then this example, the ship called Exodus 1947, helped turn the tide of sentiment towards the hundreds of thousands of Jewish refugees seeking sanctuary after World War II and their quest for a Jewish state, what would become in 1948 the new nation of Israel. And this is a very famous picture of David Ben-Gurion, the first Prime Minister of the State of Israel, publicly pronouncing the Declaration of the State of Israel on May the 14th, 1948 in Tel Aviv, Israel, beneath a large portrait of Theodor Herzl, founder of modern political Zionism, in the old Tel Aviv Museum of Art building on Rothschild Street. And this is how the New York Times recorded it, how they recorded Israel's independence in 1948. Zionists proclaim new state of Israel. Truman recognizes it and hopes for peace. Tel Aviv is bombed. Egypt orders invasion. 
And look at that clever image of the children of Israel going through the parted waters and then it becomes the down ramp of, a tel of an El Al plain. And then that's a, a more modern picture of younger Israelis arriving in their country. And yet the Wailing Wall photo just demonstrates the combination of a misguided trust in their traditions and their modern military. In fact, this is up to date 2022. Their annual military spending has risen to 21 billion, 257,459 so 20, 21 trillion, 257 billion, 459 and 600 pounds in, in just one year. And it's gone up and up and up. Then there's a picture of the security fence, they call it. And there's also an image of uh, the Israeli gas pipeline to Europe, which is still under construction, started in 2019. And it'll be interesting to see what uh, President Putin thinks of that. And look at the amazing transformation of desert land through incredibly clever irrigation techniques. And yet they rely on themselves for this self-proclaimed security. How could a man have written the Bible without the help of God. It would have been absolutely impossible. Just as nobody could have written the history of Israel in advance, nobody could have invented Christ, could they? The nature of Jesus Christ's life is proof that he really existed. Now the first men and women to be followers of Jesus Christ were by, well most of the time they were persecuted because of their beliefs. And these are the very people who would have made up a story of Christ had he been invented. It just doesn't make sense does it? Why would they invent something that led to their persecution and death in very many cases. Not even the leaders of the early Ecclesia escaped. In fact, they suffered most. Look at this, what the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 24. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once was I stoned. Thrice I have suffered shipwreck, a night and a day have I been in the deep. So lashed at least five times, beaten three times and even stoned once. Why would Paul have allowed himself to suffer so much because of his preaching if Christ had been a figment of his imagination. Matthew chapter 5 verse 39 tells us that the followers of Christ led non-violent lifestyles as Christ commanded in that verse. But I say unto you that ye resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. Now from a human point of view, this would hardly have been a sensible thing to do in the times of the brutal, brutal Roman Empire. The apostles would not have invented the story of Christ's resurrection as they suffered dearly for it and they would have known in advance that they would suffer for it. Now the only real explanation for their behaviour is that Christ really did exist. And because of that, we can confidently believe that the whole Bible is the word of the living God. Thank you.